But I've come here uh, to Sydney from far away with a message. And the message, it's a message that I hope that we can move from just being a vision to being a reality. And so in 2015, access to justice, in my view, has to be core business for law societies. Legal regulators, like your Barrister Society, need to work to increase public access to justice, including access to legal services and the justice system. Um, you heard about all my uh, fancy titles. Uh, I'm vice president and president-elect of the Federation, uh, and I chair our standing committee on access to legal services, and I was involved, as uh, Tilly mentioned, with the um, uh, National Action Committee on Access to Justice. Uh, I actually am quite passionate about access to justice and access to legal services, um, and it's a big part uh, of my professional life. And that brings me back to the real topic uh, of my uh, talk this morning, and that is access to justice, of course, and the responsibility, I would say to you, of legal regulators, like your law society and others, to improve access for our citizens. So I want to start, if I could, by just uh, sharing uh, my definition of access to justice to frame a little bit of the discussion today. And I want everybody, um, I want to invite everybody in the room to uh, broaden your understanding, if you would, of what that term access to justice means. And I would say to you that access to justice is far more than just providing greater access to the courts or pro bono legal services. It's a lot more than that. Uh, the courts are an integral part of this. I see that uh, His Honor is looking at me closely uh, in the fourth row. Uh, the courts are a key part uh, of this, but they're certainly not where the story ends. It's not just about that. It's about far more. And based on the work that I see uh, your Barrister Society is currently involved with, I'm really confident um, that your law society already shares this broad concept of what access to justice actually means. Um, when I think about justice, uh, I think of it as a uh, foundation of Canadian society. And, you know, justice implies that our society is fair, that our society is equal, so you might want to ask yourselves this question. Do you really think our justice system is as fair and equal as it could be? Are we there? No. I'd suggest to you that if you, if you want to answer that question honestly, the answer is we have a lot of work to do. I think we really do. There are many areas where Canada shines globally as fair and just, but you know there are many areas where collectively, uh, and I mean collectively, we can and we must improve the job that we're doing. Your new uh, president, uh, Jill uh, Perry, alluded to this, uh, and many of you, uh, I'm sure, are likely aware that our formal justice system uh, is in a crisis. Uh, we have a justice system right now that's paid for by the public that, in my view, the public can't really use effectively. Jill took the high road. She said, no statistics. Uh, now I'm going to take the low road and uh, give you some numbers. Um, okay, here, here's, uh, here's uh, three or four for you. About 50% of people try to solve problems on their own with either no or minimal legal or authoritative non-legal assistance, okay? 50% of people do that. Less than 7% of people will use the formal court or tribunal systems to resolve their problems, less than 7%. And of those people, there's an increasing number of people self-representing in Canadian courts, often well over 50% of those people depending upon the kind of case you have, the court you're in, jurisdiction. And um, just to dispel a little bit of a myth, um, usually those people who are self-represented litigants, they're not doing it by choice. Okay? Some are, but most not by choice. 
So think about this. With 93% of the legal problems getting resolved without any formal court or tribunal system contact, access to justice is going to have to be, it must be, much more than just the courts. So you may now be thinking, hearing all this, um, why uh, must broad public access to justice be core business for legal regulators? I know uh, many at your law society acknowledge the importance of access to justice. You've heard a little bit about that. But um, as core business, um, is access really a regulator's core regulatory work? Well, let's, let's think about that. For some law societies across the country, the easy answer is that they're enabling statutes, law societies, creature of statute. Those statutes require them to improve access to justice. But, you know, even without being mandated to do so in legislation to increase access to justice, I believe, and I'm going to try to persuade you, I hope, this morning, that law societies, as stakeholders in the administration of justice in Canada, have a responsibility to make our society more just. It's a responsibility. Why do they have that responsibility? Law societies derive much of their public credibility, their powers, their responsibilities from their mandates to preserve and protect the public interest. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, if you're a legal regulator, you're built, in my submission, to work for the people. You're there to advance access to justice because that's for the people. That's why the legal regulators are there. And law societies, uh, did you say it was going to be provocative? Okay, I'm going to provocative part. Uh, <laughs> law societies, in, in my view, must not simply be reactive. They must lead. They have to be out front. And law societies can do that by ensuring that access to justice becomes part of their core business. And in my opinion, you're not going to get the results that we would like to get as justice system stakeholders um, if we're not responsible for uh, delivering on making access core business. I think you have to do it. So what's the assumption underneath a, a lot of that? Um, I'm going to say to you that um, in order to increase public access to justice, law societies have to start with uh, the assumption that you can't make access better without engaging with the public. Yeah. And uh, I was at uh, your dinner last night, which was uh, uh, lovely, and uh, I enjoyed myself very much. And I was uh, thrilled to hear uh, people talking about Tilly Play and um, um, her theme of engagement echoed in uh, part by your new president, because uh, engagement is a key part of access as core business for regulators. So I want to underscore that point about the need to engage with and put the public first. I'm going to read to you, uh, if you'll permit me, just a couple of quotes from the uh, Action Committee report from 2013 um, on access to justice and civil and family matters. Um, this is in that report. We need to change our primary focus. Too often, we focus inward on how the system operates from the point of view of those who work in it. For example, court processes, okay? language, location, operating times, administrative systems, paper, filing requirements, typically make sense, those processes, and work for lawyers, judges, and court staff. They often do not make sense or do not work for litigants. Second quote, part of put the people first, the focus must be on the people who need to use the system. This focus must include all people, especially members of immigrant, aboriginal and rural populations, and other vulnerable groups. Uh, litigants, and particularly self-represented litigants, are not 
as they are too often seen, an inconvenience. They are why the system exists. Last quote, stay with me. Until we involve those who use the system in the reform process, the system will not really work for those who use it. Those of us working within the system need to remember that it exists to serve the public. That must be the focus of all reform efforts. I believe very strongly in that message. Uh, I think that is the correct focus. Uh, that sounded a bit lectury, that last little part. Let me give you some good news. Okay? This is my favorite kind of uh, talk. I get to come to jurisdiction and tell you about all the really good things that you're doing. <coughs> because you guys are a great example. Your Barrister Society um, uh, is a fantastic example of doing exactly that. You're prioritizing engaging, Matthew Tilly's word of engagement, engaging with the public. And your Talk Justice initiative is a terrific example of public engagement for justice system stakeholders uh, across the country, and I'm going to suggest uh, maybe farther than that. Um, you heard Jill talk a little bit about this really amazing program. Um, I truly believe that. I applaud your Barrister Society for listening. Can I just stop on that word for a minute? So um, uh, your Barrister Society is listening to people. They're listening to better understand the justice-related needs and the experiences of your diverse communities in Nova Scotia. And you're listening here in Nova Scotia in order to uh, integrate those voices into your reforms. It's so important, in my opinion, for us not just to think about um, what the community needs, not just to think about that, but actually to go out and hear the community tell us how we can improve uh, access to justice. I'll give you some other examples. And by the way, um, is it a digression? I'll give you a little shout out to your society record. Um, for those of you who are uh, already uh, drank the uh, Barrister Society uh, Kool-Aid and you're all part of that uh, system, you already know the site record is kind of cool. Um, but for those of you who uh, are out uh, practicing and uh, not formally uh, going to council meetings and doing that kind of stuff, I got a few of these. Uh, Shirley sent me uh, a, a few of these, I believe. Um, and your society record is chock full of all the good stuff that the Barrister Society is doing. Uh, or I ordinarily would not uh, be uh, loading on the compliments about this, except it happens to fit into uh, my theme because there's so much stuff on access, it's, um, it's an inspiration to me and I'm thrilled to see it. So your last two society records, uh, Talk Justice and Action on Access. It's fantastic. Um, I want to talk about a couple of other initiatives um, that I'm aware of in Nova Scotia. So uh, at the request of representatives of the Mi'kmaq community. Your society is providing support to a group of community and justice system stakeholders participating in an Aboriginal child welfare working group tackling child welfare issues on reserves in Nova Scotia. So there are all kinds of models. I want to tell you that there's one way. There isn't one way. There are multiple models for how you meaningfully engage with community stakeholders in order to innovate access to justice system reform. Um, one of my favorite examples, um, it was from uh, last year in British Columbia, where they did a social lab, um, uh, which I didn't know much about. I, I did a little bit of uh, uh, looking into. And it's, uh, it's a social lab model, uh, which is a cross-sector community stakeholder engagement. And it's being used to innovate in the area of family law. So what they do in a social lab is to use a systemic approach, so they say, involving participants from across the social services sector. Okay, really interesting. Not just the justice sector, but across the social services sector. And the focus there is on fostering innovative solutions to people's problems. Okay, remember I said a few minutes ago, put the people first. It's about the user. Great example of how to figure out how to do that. And so these are just a couple of examples that highlight the importance of engaging with the public and uh, asking the community 
asking the community how best to increase access. And engaging with the public, engaging with community service providers and other stakeholders allows law societies to derive creative solutions to access problems. Um, let me spend a minute talking about innovation and uh, law societies being innovation enablers. There are, uh, it's a, this is sort of a terrifying thing to me. There are so many innovative legal service, it's terrifying because I'm a lawyer in private practice. Uh, in, in <laughs> um, there are so many innovative legal service providers in the market today. Examples, uh, Rocket Lawyer, LegalZoom, and uh, companies like this are leveraging online platforms. They're leveraging artificial intelligence to provide guided self-serve legal services in bulk at highly discounted rates, okay? So, many of you have heard of Rocket Lawyer, I'm sure. These services refer more complicated cases to lawyers for more specialized assistance, but as many of you would know, there's a great number of legal problems um, that can be dealt with uh, quickly, summarily, and these kinds of services are specializing in going after that market. It's innovation in providing legal services. Um, I don't know um, uh, if you've heard of this. In Canada, there's a, something called Access Law, A-X-E-S-S -S Law, and that provides a high volume legal service out of some Walmart stores in Ontario. I'm sure many of you have heard of Tesco Law in the UK about uh, you know, grocery store law, okay? Um, access Law, providing services at significantly reduced cost to consumers. I bet, um, I'm looking across the room here, I bet a bunch of you have heard of a uh, number of these innovative providers that I've never heard of. And I'm guessing that by next week, there's going to be more of them. That's the pace of change that's happening with legal service providers. I would say to you that the legal regulators, they have a need to uh, think about innovation. Uh, they have a need as well, as long as you go back to the traditional mandate for law societies, to identify risks to the public. But where they find that uh, the risks to the public are low or non-existent with other providers, they need to remove barriers, regulatory barriers, to providing low-cost services to consumers. Because the providing service to the consumers, to the users of the system, is the goal of an effective access to justice. So legal regulators, um, I would say to you, can play multiple roles to promote innovation in legal service provision. Right? Some of those things I've just, I've just talked about, about getting involved in that. Um, you're not gonna believe me if I just tell you it's just the Barrister Society that's uh, interested in uh, working on uh, access and making it core business, because there are law societies across the country um, who are exploring new regulatory models as well. Uh, quite, uh, as um, uh, progressive, uh, I might suggest, as, uh, as your law society, because I think you're doing a particularly uh, great job on introducing entity regulation. But there are other jurisdictions who are looking at alternative business structures, for example. So in Ontario, uh, they're looking at that. In the Western provinces, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, also having that discussion about alternative business structures. Um, and focusing on outcomes to revolutionize the way law societies do their uh, work and, and in doing that, as I think you will know from hearing from Jill and from uh, Daryl and from the communications uh, from your barrister society, in doing that kind of uh, reform, you're improving and creating opportunities to increase public access to justice. And again, this is this is uh, this is one of those real suck uppy uh, speeches, isn't it? <laughs> okay. uh, this is this is quite. Sick. Your Barrister Society, I have to say it because it's true, your Barrister Society is one of the leaders in consistently, across the country, in consistently analyzing access to justice possibilities which are created by these kinds of regulatory reforms. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Okay? You're an excellent example, actually, of my thesis of my talk today, which is how law societies have to make access part of their core work. And as law societies overhaul the way that they do business in different ways and at different, different speeds, the implications, the opportunities for access 
uh, need to be identified at every step along the way. And I'm, my hope is that when these reforms are put in place, and I'm pretty confident that this will happen uh, in Nova Scotia for sure, once those reforms are in place, law societies will take the lead in promoting and exposing opportunities for increasing access to legal services. I was interested in Jill's comments about crisis, crisis uh, and challenges. Um, I was going to introduce the word opportunities as well, that those crises uh, provide uh, law societies with opportunities to make a difference. Okay. So, I talked to you for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm killing you on a Saturday morning. What's the takeaway? Okay. What's your takeaway from, from all of this? I tell you now that law societies need to do something different from what they're doing now and seriously consider a more radical role beyond their current vision. Law societies need to engage with the public by not just talking to the public, but really listening to what the public has to say. And the second part of that is there needs to be action taken by doing things. Not just talking, but doing. Okay. I've been on lots of committees, I'm on lots of access committees. We do a lot of talking, we do a lot of talk about doing. That's the challenge, to turn all that well-intentioned talk um, into uh, access wins. Wins on access. I'm going to give you one last quote from the National Action Committee. They said this. We need research, thinking, and deliberation. But for meaningful change to occur, they're not enough. We also need action. We cannot put off to another day formulating and carrying out a specific and effective action plan. There have been many reports and reform initiatives, but the concrete results have been extremely modest. To make a meaningful difference in the lives of the people who rely on the justice system, we need to move beyond wise words and bridge the implementation gap. So ultimately, uh, what I told you, I think, uh, is what I truly believe, and that is it's critically important for law societies to take the bull by the horns and make access to justice part of their core business. So, you're all, you're all stunned by how long this uh, talk has been. Uh, I, I, <laughs> these are some of the things I've told you. Let me close now by asking you a question. And the question is this. If we aren't taking steps to help our citizens have a more accessible, equal, and fair justice system, then why are we here? What are we doing here if we're not doing that? And I say to you that as regulators, we're here to serve the public interest. And making access our core business will help us do exactly that. Thank you so very much for inviting me.